Hastings was an amazing battle. One of the most significant battles in, in military history for two reasons, because of what it meant in terms of um, the future of, of England, Britain, uh, and what we now call, you know, Western civilization, and also because of the intensity of the battle uh, and how much of a near-run thing it was. So it is just one of those dramatic battles. Um, it was fought at Senlac Ridge, which is uh, a ridge at what we now call Battle. It's quite some. It's about seven or eight miles from Hastings, uh, and you can still see it today because the, the ridge is still there, um, where Harold's shield wall was. You can you can see the spot. You can see the spot where Harold, <coughs> where Harold fell, and you can see the hill, the ridge up which the the Normans came. It's very uh, evocative, um, and a great place to visit. Um, the key features of the battle were essentially that uh, it was a battle of attrition, which was un unusual. Um, most battles were decided quite quickly. The winner became obvious and people on the whole retreated from the battlefield acknowledging the winner and many lives would have been saved. This was a fight to the death. The Normans, had won there was no going home for the Normans. Uh, if they'd attempted to get back on their ships, they would have been cut down. Um, because it was the amount of time it would have taken them to put 3,000 horses uh, and maybe as many as eight or 9,000, 10,000 men onto um, the, their ships to go home. So they, it was a one-way ticket for them. They either, they either won or died. Mm. On the other hand, the English knew they were fighting for their homes and their families and the future of their country. So it was a fight to the death. And the two, the two commanders... William and Harold were not the sort of men who were going to back off. Bear in mind that Harold, um, only just a few days earlier, had defeated the greatest Viking of his, of his, generation, of his age, Harold Hardrada, who was captain of the Varangian Guard, who was um, a wonderfully gifted man, one of the true Viking heroes, who had already beaten the two northern earls at Fulford Gate. Harold rushed up there with a depleted army and and defeated him. Uh, and Hardrada and the entire Viking aristocracy were killed. And then he rushes all on the way back. He, he discovers that William has landed on the south coast. Um, critically, he probably should have taken more time in London to uh, gather more forces. But William was goading him by raping and pillaging and killing all, all along the south coast. And William and, and Harold rushed to, to try and protect them and probably went too early. Um, but he was brave, maybe too brave. Even so, the battle was ferocious, lasted all day and was basically an attritional battle between the heavy Norman destriers, the heavy Norman war horses, marauding up the hill against the English shield wall. The English shield wall, the house carls, the elite warriors house carls, shield wall was the English strength, the Norman cavalry was their strength. And William just literally wasted the lives of his men in continual um, attacks on the English shield wall in order to weaken it um, man by man, uh, until eventually uh, it was too weak to hold. Late in the afternoon, a, another half hour of... If, if darkness had come half an hour earlier, or perhaps he Harold had 500 more men, who ironically were, were on their way from London. Um, there were more men coming to the battlefield. Either of those he, he probably would have won, but he didn't. And then late in the day, Harold fell, and English history was changed forever. It was an interesting time in terms of our national identity. Britain, at that point, was an amalgam of ancient Celts, uh, Anglo-Saxons who'd arrived 
four, five, six hundred years earlier, and later Vikings, Danes, as they were called, um, who had arrived within the last um, hundred or so years. Um, the Vic the the Celts occupied generally the western part of Britain. The Danes were in pockets or throughout Ireland, the northwest Scotland, the Lake District, um, parts of North, North Wales, and pockets right along the east coast. And intermingled in England with them were Anglo-Saxons. And it's difficult to know what those identities meant for the people at the time, how tribal it was, how how many of them had any sense of the of England being a nation at all. Um, it was probably more like tribal identities than um, national identities. But since um, Alfred's time, there had been a sense of England and the the earls of the of the south of Britain, certainly east of Wales, south of Northumbria, having some sense of Englishness. So Englishness was sort of in embryo. Um, but then along come the Normans, who overlay that um, loose set of identities, a rigid hierarchical feudal system, um, with Norman French being spoken at the top, and dominate that country for the next several hundred years. So that that mixing, that melting pot there that was determined by William winning at Hastings was absolutely critical to what we now call Englishness. Because the Norman England then became so powerful, the Norman English, yes, the Norman English then systematically started to conquer their, their Celtic neighbours. And out of that, of course, we got what we now call, loosely called Britishness. Ironically, a thousand years later, or 950 years later, with um, the Celts of Britain asserting themselves in their national identity, in a federalised Britain, English, the English now having to rediscover themselves within Britishness, because Britishness is effectively disappearing, as the, the, the Celts and the Welsh find their, their original identity and it's left therefore to the English to find whatever is whatever does remain of Britishness now depends on the English deciding what who they are within that federation because most of the for, for generations most of the English have just swapped British and English around as the same thing where of course now it, that doesn't work because the, the Welsh the Scots and the Irish have their own identity and see themselves as a Celt on the one hand and British on the other. Now the English having to do the same. Say so see themselves as British on the one hand and English on the other. And now we're having to find out what that English is. And that's a fascinating story and begins in ten sixty six. One of the themes that runs strongly th through conquest is that it is a people's story. And I make a claim that the opposition to the Normans, the the revolts, the 1069 revolt and the, the, the other sort of opposition that Carolyn, uh, preceded that was the beginnings of a tradition of freedom in this country. Um, you have to pick a point when you think a national characteristic begins and if you think about Magna Carta, um, <clears throat> the Cromwellian Commonwealth, uh, Chartism, the Reform Act, th those things that have created freedom and democracy in this country, I've made the suggestion that that passion for freedom um, began in opposition to the Normans um, in 1068-69 through to the fall of the Siege of Ely in 1071 and, and therefore I've put Hereward and Torfida and their personal journey at the heart of that. It's obviously hugely romanticised and fictionalised 
but nevertheless they therefore embody the beginnings of something which we all now hold dear to our hearts, which is our, our freedom. The talisman of truth is their guide on their personal journey. And it was given to them by Torfida's father, a really interesting character I wanted to create, um, called the Old Man of the Wildwood. And it, it, he came to me because Heriwood had to find a way out of his banishment. If you were banished in those days, there was nowhere for you to go. Nobody could help you, talk to you. Uh, you, you, you it was a, effectively a death sentence. So, and, and you would disappear in the, into the wildwood of England. And that's what he did. And I had him meet um, a, a mysterious man there who is like lots of the legends we have of um, wise hermits, of mystics. Um, and I wanted it to be part of a tradition we have of, uh, well, it's basically the what, what's called the green man tradition, the wood, wood woes, it, it, the memories that we have of the ancient ways, it, even going back to paganism in this country and the druids and so on because I think that's a theme that fascinates us you know it's even in Shakespeare and it's in lots of literature um, and it and it helps us come to terms with our beliefs you know what do we believe in do we believe in supernatural um, guiding forces do we believe in nature do we believe in our our own rational rationality as a guide in our lives and I wanted to explore those things religion is obviously an important part of the 11th century um, and a lot of the a lot of the story takes place in in and around uh, abbeys and cathedrals and so on but also paganism is still there in the subculture in the 11th century and at, at the same time Torfida is a hugely intelligent woman and so she wrestles with those issues. Does she rest on her father's sort of ancient wisdom? Does she rest on the power of the word of God? Or does she rest on her intellect? And, and those, all those things are sort of wrapped up in the talisman. It's known that Heriwood had a wife called Torfida, but she only gets a very brief mention. Um, so she was a blank canvas. I think the monks, uh, uh, the monks who wrote his, the monks of Peter who wrote his story, Heriwood's story, I think said something like she was practiced in the dark arts, which is an intriguing line. Probably meant she was very intelligent. Um, so I, I just took that as my canvas and tried to create a character who was a good counterpoint to him, and would help him on on his personal journey. Uh, and so I've tried to create a, a, this strong female character. I think certainly authors of historical fiction probably all think that their books will make great films. <laughs> but I'm absolutely certain mine will make a great film, um, simply because it is such a rich visual story. And it wouldn't be a cheap film to make, because the journey that Her Herod and Torfida go on is an immense journey. The battles involved are huge battles. Um, the locations are, you know, all over Europe. So it wouldn't be easy to do. And I, you know, I understand that there are, first of all, there are a million times more potential writers than actual writers. And there are thousands of books and only a few films. So it's, um, it's a big, big leap for it to to become a film it's got to it's got to be a well-selling book first and it's got to be appreciated and enjoyed but then you never know um, maybe <laughs>